Dear Jesus, as you've created this church so long ago that you assume your place as its elder and teach us, lead us, show us your way. In the name of Jesus, the Christ of God, we reach out to you. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Justice, could you mute number four, please? Ah, that felt good. It always feels good after a long week to come together and worship. How are you all? The mighty who come out in the summertime church. We should have church in a tent or something. Right? Summertime? Isn't that what they used to do? That would be fun. I know many would agree. I want to open up this morning with our time in the Word, <clears throat> and I actually, as is often the case, had planned to preach something else until a couple of days ago, because what was stuck in my heart was the comments that I made last week about the previous week, and how everybody came together, and church was awesome, and all of that different stuff. And I want you to understand that that's not just me saying that. Or that's not me like reading a uh, self-help book on leadership. You know, a healthy organization is one that can function, blah, 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 blah. You've read them all. We've all been down that road in business. It's biblical. It's biblical. The church is an organization to be sure. There are people in the church and we make decisions and we, we help organize things and carry things along. And there is that part of it that is undeniable. But it's so much more. The reason that we do that, the reason that we're drawn together, and really the reason, ultimately, why we are drawn through Him, the Holy Spirit, salvation. All bets are off if we're just another social organization that has yard sales and bake sales and car washes. So what? You can have a thousand car washes and bake sales and die and go to hell and it doesn't matter. I don't understand the purpose of that. So well, there's so much more, right? We do it not just in the name of Jesus Christ, but because of Jesus Christ. And I've, I've tried to make that clear too. When we talk about the ministries of our church, that we, you know, anybody can stand and do something and say, in the name of Jesus Christ. But you and I both know when you're in the presence of Jesus Christ. And that, and the Holy Spirit is working in and through somebody. And whether they're proclaiming, oh, you know, look at Jesus, look at Jesus, or whether they're just living it, you know, right? And, and that's what I'm trying to get across. That's the biblical piece of it. When we come together like this, church truly is interactive. And that doesn't just mean that it's question and answer between the pastor and the, and the, and the people. It's interactive between you and Jesus. And we come together, not so you can just sort of sit there and you know, open up your heads and have stuff dumped into it, knowledge, but so that you can pray and that you can worship and we can talk with one another and we can share with one another. And we can learn and grow so that when we leave this place and the world immediately starts beating at our door again, we walk through it with him. We have deep roots. We're going to read today that this is a biblical principle of how to do church. And I call it my job, your job. And my job is your job. And your job is my job. Because we're all given those gifts in the church, as a part of the church. So let's take a look. Now, I, I went to Ephesus, well, Ephesians. And I've been there all week long. And Ephesians, the church in Ephesus must have been an awful lot like, I think, a lot of churches today. It seems to be typical in a lot of ways. When you read the book of Ephesians, Paul's teaching runs the gamut. 
All right? There, there's not one particular big issue that we see in, in some of his teachings to other churches. He, Ephesus is a church that's come together, and they have given their lives over to Jesus Christ, and then they're sitting there sort of going, okay, what, what next? What's next? What, what's next? What do we do now? So Paul gives a good theological teaching to Ephesus that kind of covers, covers the range, you know, that you've given your lives over now. Your lives will be transformed, and you'll begin to bear fruit, and all of these different things that we know and understand. We remember, too, that this is kind of typical of a lot of churches. You remember Revelations? Ephesus is mentioned in Revelations. And Jesus says to the church in Ephesus about how good they were and how hard they worked and how they were a good church, but they forgot their first love. Right? They, that, that cornerstone that we're always talking about in here, the cornerstone of the church, which is Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ, relationship with Jesus Christ, submission to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So it seems like Ephesus, and this is what I mean by typical, is, it, is a church that's kind of doing all the right things, trying to do all the right things, have all of the right ministries, and do all that stuff that churches do, but they've kind of walked away from that personal and corporate submission to Jesus. So they're doing stuff in the name of Jesus without Jesus. Does that make sense? So like I said, I can go out. I can be a complete unbeliever. I, and, and Scripture tells us that the angels of Satan will look like angels of light. Right? And you can stand on a street corner saying, in the name of Jesus, anybody trying to lead somebody to hell can say that. It's when we're walking and living and truly submitted. Okay? So Ephesus is uh, missing that piece. <laughs> the piece, but missing that piece. So let's, Paul teaches these people in chapter 4. And let's read a, be, a little bit of chapter 4 here. <clears throat> Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord. Now, Paul's writing from a very unique perspective because he's back in jail. All right? This is like us doing a Skype Sunday morning. I'm in the Cumberland County Prison for preaching the Word, though. Right? I'm in the Cumberland County Prison for preaching the Word because you're no longer in America allowed to preach the Word. There I am in prison, and somehow I get out my iPhone, and we do FaceTime, and you guys are in a tent somewhere because you're not allowed to worship. All right? So therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. We've gone over that before in here. It's a calling. It's not just, oh, yeah, well, hey, that Jesus thing sounds good. I want to go to heaven. Sign me up. Mm. That's, that's a good first thought, maybe. But it's a calling. You're called. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. And that is a Paul, that's a Pauline teaching to the ancient world when they, everybody, almost everybody but the Jewish people were polytheists. You had a God for everything. So the Lord was transitioning the Gentiles to, from this belief, from these made-up gods to the one true God. So he's saying there's one God, one spirit, one unity, one church. You look to God for all things. He's the God of all creation. So there's a good teaching there. And we see that teaching elsewhere. And Paul goes on. I have to put my Bible up because I took my glasses off. However, listen now, however, and this is where it changes from gods who do things to you to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the church 
influencing the world. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crown of captives and he gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended, clearly means that Christ also descended into our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. So again, we could, this is just building up to the piece that I'm really going to teach today. But you can see that Paul is getting across to them one God, one spirit, the creator of the universe, one power. And it's not like what you're used to, right? It used to be you, you give gifts, you make sacrifices, you do whatever the God of the sun or the God of the moon or the God of fertility or the God of the crops or the God of the rain. Go on, and, you know, whatever they demand of you, you do. He's saying, look, there's something different here. This is different. You have the power. You have the gifts. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Boom. Boom. And the emphasis is not on my job, right? The emphasis is not on my job. The emphasis for me, as was evident two weeks ago, is on your job. My responsibility, and I fail at it, is if you can't do church when I'm gone, right? If you can't do church if I get sick, you can't do church when I'm on vacation. If you guys are incapable of doing that, then I have failed. Clearly, Scripture teaches us that. My responsibility is to not stand up here. Well, remember that ladder, Frank? <laughs> it's not to stand up here in front of Jesus and say, this is church according to Brian, and this is the world according to Brian, and you will do it or... Well, uh, that, yeah. Right? This is church according to Scripture. This is the Word. Right? This is what God is teaching us, and this is why. And unto each body of Christ, and there are many more pastors in this congregation than just me, and there are many more teachers in this congregation than just me, and there are those with the gift of apostleship in this congregation and evangelism in this congregation. Unto each congregation, God gives these people for what reason? To build. Everything that he does is to build the body of Christ. So one, the word goes on. The world goes on. And I'm not, I'm not being glib here, but if I walk out on the street and get hit by a bus, the world goes on. The word goes on. It's not the word according to me. It's the word according to this. And it's in you. And so it goes on. Does that mean, you know, and then that, that, I just felt like I was a little glib last week when I said that's the way it should be. And without me, you know, there should always be church. But if you don't show up, I've got a devotion. You know, I've got a prayer hour. I mean, I guess it's church or whatever you can call it within, you know. But that relationship is not just good leadership according to what everybody says. It's biblical. It's the way church should be. And here's the biggest beneficiary. The biggest side effect also relates to the biggest beneficiary of this principle. Any and everybody who comes to us off of the street or elsewhere, every semi-believer, non-believer, every anybody who enters into this congregation 
is surrounded by apostles, evangelists, teachers, pastors. It's surrounded by the word. Right? It's not just me. If I fail to connect with somebody, I mean, they're connecting not with me, but with the church, with the body. And they're like, wow. And we had that feeling so many times. That's the overwhelming response we get. And again, some folks, it's for just a reason and a week or two, they experience that. It's sometimes it's for a season and people are with this body of Christ through a season in their lives. And sometimes it's for a lifetime. This is where they're called and where they belong. And we've, we accept that. But we've got to continue to be what the Bible asks us to be for all people. Right? We, can't, we can't say, how, you know, well, that person came three times and then they never came back. Were we who Jesus asked us to be? If the answer in our hearts is yes, then that person was given exactly what they needed for exactly when they needed it. Maybe they were presented with exactly what they needed and they rejected it. I preach that as well. Okay. So we, and we're, we've got to be okay with that. Our only concern is are we being equipped as the body of Christ? Are our roots deep? And are you, here's the challenge, Living up to your end of the responsibility. So that's where it's gonna, I'm going to challenge you a little bit with that statement because it obviously, according to the word, it's my responsibility and our responsibility as teachers and preachers and pastors to equip the body for all the work of the church. And that, is, that includes yard sales and car washes, but it also includes being the word. It also includes surrounding people who are walking in incredibly difficult times. It also includes celebrating with people. It also includes all of the above. You know what I'm saying? You know, are we doing that? Now, certainly there are times when you wake up on a Sunday morning, you know what, and the reality is you, you want to just come to church and sort of just be quiet and you know, just do your own thing, and that's, that's not what I'm talking about. You, know, you don't have to be like all out there, and it's all hugs and, you know, and that sort of thing every Sunday. There are times when you just want to, it's just you and Jesus, and you sort of want to be left alone <laughs> and part of the body of Christ. I get that. That's people. That's okay. But overall, right? If you are being equipped in this body of Christ, are you living it? How are you living it? And that can look any, any way, you know, as many different ways as there are people who feel that way in this body. It looks differently for everybody. How are you living it? And some people speak, some, you know, the whole deal. So we look at this and we see Paul trying to teach these guys that it's more than just sitting there like school, learning facts and figures and that sort of thing. It's more. And you're going to be equipped. And when you are equipped by the Holy Spirit, the, the body of Christ affects the world. Affects the world. So he's changing, and God is changing this way of thinking. This way of thinking about God and about God's. He's changing it. All right, let's finish. I just want to finish the scripture here. <clears throat> he says, This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. We're growing. We're growing roots. We're understanding more and more and more. Now that never stops your entire life. You learn more. You grow more mature. Measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. 
only possible when we're in Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Now, does this sound like church today and religion today? I'll say religion today. Let me, let me give you my take on Christianity. I think you're going to like it a lot better than Jesus' take on Christianity. And that is like, we hear that so much. And we all know that the best lies are 99.9% true. And so we need, to, we need to be in the Word. We need to be teaching one another. We need to be praying with and for one another. Because it's getting more difficult with all the ways that information is disseminated in our culture today to hear and live in the truth. Let me tell you what I think about Ephesians. Now, if I, you know, blah, 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 blah. And Paul didn't mean that. He meant, the, you, know, you know, whatever. That is prophecy right there. That's a prophetic writing. The 2,000 years old and even more applicable today. We will not be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. The reason, the cornerstone, the purpose, the person, the spirit, the God. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Now notice, in other parts of Paul's teaching, he talks about other spiritual gifts. But that's not where Ephesus was. Ephesus was at a place where they were in that sort of what now phase. We believe on Jesus Christ. We believe he is our Savior. <clears throat> what now? And so he was saying that the Spirit of God is going to move in you now, bind you together, draw your teaching and your focus together, and you together are going to change the world. You are one body. And as we are here, right, Jesus Christ first, caring with and for one another, we are the body that affects the world. That's why we're here. So, <clears throat> my job, and I'm not saying this with any pride, I've accepted it. I want this job. I've given myself over to this responsibility. How about you? You do more in church than just listen. Can you submit yourself to Christ, build your relationship through the power of the Holy Spirit, and find out for yourself what He wants you to do? You may be doing it. I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir, as they say in church, right? But do that examination. Because church isn't school. I'm not just here to teach you stuff. We're here to grow and come together in Christ and change the world. Let's pray. Father God, it just uh, love you, Jesus. We understand Paul's teaching to be specific to the power of the Holy Spirit because that is what the people of Ephesus lost. They were a good church. They walked away, they walked off the path of that love, of that personal relationship, and that church relationship 
submission to Jesus Christ. And Paul taught them that that is your cornerstone. All things that this church will do, Father God, will be made possible by the Holy Spirit. We love you and we thank you for your word, for your teaching. We thank you for our gathering today. We give ourselves over to you in your name. Amen. Amen. At this time, we'll take a little break um, and uh, get some water or fan or take a cold shower, whatever you need to do to wake up. It's warm. So, uh, enjoy yourself. We'll be back shortly with some announcements.